uh, there is conflict happening in your motherland like ukraine right now how do you think the gita could be applied uh, to maybe come to a resolution do you have any thoughts on that uh well you see i guess uh, there is uh, there is a lot of uh, things involved and uh, uh, first of all uh, we all know that now we are living in the age of kali and uh, the conflicts are inevitable uh there are there is such a great diminish in the qualities of humans that the conflicts have become part and parcel of life you know we have conflict for conflicts from 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 the moment we open our eyes you know every morning and then we have to get through the day uh, sorting out multiple issues and all so it's the wars and conflicts are inevitable in this age uh i mean one of the reasons is because people don't uh, you know follow the, <laughs> the 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 rules which are given to them uh, for for multiple reasons for different reasons uh so wars are sort of like inevitable but we always have to look at the time and circumstances and what kind of pri- principles are we are standing for namaste Every human being on earth has at some point or the other asked themselves the question will i be happy the search for happiness is universal the answer to this question perhaps lies in the bhagavad gita the ancient wisdom in gita touches upon many philosophical as well as management concepts that have been rediscovered independently much later by several western thinkers albeit in a piecemeal approach an atheist gets the gita is a book that attempts to demystify the wisdom in the timeless text of bhagavad gita so we are very very happy to have rahul ji and galina ji the authors of this book today so rahul singh is a banker by day and a writer by night rahul is an expert at connecting three eyes ideas insights and individuals hailing from ayodhya he is an alumnus of nanyang technical university in singapore and also an has an mba from iim bangalore he has authored three books engineering to ikigai you know the glory not the story and the latest one an atheist gets the gita welcome rahul ji thank you so much thank you so much uh, our, our our other guest today is dr galina kogut uh, she is the co-author of the book uh, she is a researcher with the national institute of education and has a phd from ntu singapore she focuses on pedagogy with specific emphasis on language acquisition and teacher professional development So Galina ji was born in Ukraine and she's widely researched and taught western psychology and eastern philosophies. She has co-authored the book The Atheist and Atheist Gets the Gita. She's the president of the Ukrainian club in Singapore and was the founder for Ukrainian Language School Singapore. Welcome Galina ji, welcome Rahul ji. Really happy to have you today. So Rahul ji, let's start with you. Uh give us a little bit about uh your background and uh tell us how did you get into writing? Yeah, so uh I, as you mentioned i am from ayodhya but despite being from ayodhya i never opened uh, what to say bhagavad gita any of the scriptures and r- right under the house where i was living there is this lane which goes to hanuman gadi which is the temple of our hanuman and that entire lane is full of uh, shops shop houses selling uh, books religious books and uh, and uh, paraphernalia which you need to use for puja but i never opened any of these books and uh, fortunately for me i got a scholarship to study in singapore i came here studied engineering then worked for a while went back to india to do mba and came back and all this while i was uh, not at all exposed to bhagavad gita or any scripture for that matter and uh, ironically for me i happened to uh, chance upon bhagavad gita incidentally uh, through some uh, noble people who uh were kind of talking about the bhagavad gita concepts and its application in the modern business world and that picked my interest and then when i opened the bhagavad gita finally i realized that my entire education system was a farce because they never taught about what the purpose of human life is what a purpose of a company is why should we be existing and when i read the bhagavad gita i was totally amazed and then i realized that i am not the only one there would be millions and millions of people like me who are educated in the modern western education system because you know you could be living in india but because our education system is so uh, western influent lord macaulay designed that system by and large and we still implement that so you are very unlikely to pick up the wisdom from your own land 
So I thought, okay, now that I have acquired this, is there a way I can package this in a way which can appeal to people like me? People like me are people who are scientific, logical, uh, think of things as management frameworks. And then I thought, uh, let's attempt this. And then the result is in front of you and Atheist gets the Gita. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Galina ji, uh, let's uh, switch to you. Tell us a little bit about your journey and background uh, and how did you get introduced to Hinduism as well? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for this question, Deepti. And uh, so my story is like, now that Rahul put it this way, I was just listening to him and I was thinking, oh boy, this street full of paraphernalia and, and the religious books. Uh, as a kid, I couldn't even imagine about having anything like that. So I'm a USSR, you know, I was born in uh, Ukraine and Pehlese, uh, Ukraine too, was part of the USSR. Uh, and there was no even a question of having any religious book because this this was an of officially atheist country. So it's a communist country. The official ideology uh, is atheism. I mean, they wouldn't call it religious, uh, religion because even the word, like the mentioning of something like religion or something like that was sort of like a crime already. So uh, yeah, so you are this highly structured uh, with no choice. But then again, this question, which you just uh, mentioned at the beginning when you started talking, will I be happy or am I happy? Uh, I mean, we, there is no person who doesn't want to be happy and who doesn't ask this question uh, at least at some point in your life. So I remember asking that question. Uh, I remember asking the question before you know whether you are happy or not, you need to know who are you? Who is this I? who is going to be happy, you know, or who wants to be happy. So this is the sort of like a starting point uh, in, in my inquiry. So ever since I remember myself, I don't know, uh, uh, five years, four years old, I was asking myself a question, who am I? Why am I here? Why do I live in, on this planet? Why is it that I am I and I'm not my neighbor? Uh, let's say my neighbor girl, my friend, and why is my mother my mother and not why is it that not her mother is my mother and why things are this way and not the other way? Why am I born in this country? Why am I not born somewhere else? And, you know, this kind of questions, which uh, it's not so easy to find answers. So I would probably ask my mom like some, and she would be like, she couldn't say much about, she couldn't say any, any, any much uh, from the religious point of view, like soul or God or anything like that, because, uh, the children are small, you know, no matter how many times you tell them, don't go and tell anyone. If, if, if the child somehow go, goes out to the street and blurters to anyone, oh, you know, I'm actually um, spiritual and, you know, there is God and this is where we're going. So then tomorrow my, the parents will lose their job. I mean, literally with no exaggeration. So you can position, you can think of that country as what, what you know now about North Korea uh, in those days, like USSR in 1970s, 80s. Um, so, um, until nineties. Yeah. So, so that was my sort of like range of questions. And then, uh, I mean, this never left me, this kind of quest, this kind of search never left me. So if you are sincere, you want to find the answer to a question, you will, you know, you'll go a long way to just, to just find those answers to the questions. And then I was lucky. I, I like this Indian, uh, I like this Hindi word, Bhagishali, you know, it's just so sounding so nice, not bhagishality, because I was uh, wanting to find answers uh, to my questions. And then I finally, I, uh, at the end of like, uh, before the most, like almost before the USSR broke into pieces, like it stopped existing, it was a little bit opened up. And then this all sorts of different literature was smuggled into it, so into, into the country. So I was lucky to get hold of the smuggled book, which was a photocopy of a photocopy of some I don't know how many times they photocopied it it was a very bad quality of the print it was a typewritten like um, uh, the book which was uh, published underground because officially it couldn't have been published because it was a it was Bhagavad Gita basically and it didn't have any it was not as beautiful as what we have now you know with the picture of Krishna and Arjuna with the uh, conch shell and then uh, on the chariot no it was just a plain text which you could hardly decipher what it was written. And then I started reading almost something about karma, something about soul. And then this name Krishna came up and I was like, who's Krishna, you know? So then apparently my brother was the one who brought this smuggled book into the house. And of course we can't tell anyone because it's sort of like forbidden literature. So I asked him, 
who's Krishna? He's, he's like, I don't know. Uh, imagine, right? And I compare this with uh, Rahulji, who was walking in Ayodhya, looking at all this, who didn't even bother to, you know, open those books. And then there is, at the same time, in parallel, at some other, you know, unimaginable world, in some Bilkul Dusra Deshme, there are people who are like looking for something and the only thing they can get is this you know like a really like hard you can't hardly re, you can hardly read the decipher the words from that book because you are just so much you so much want to know the answers to your questions so i mean not 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 just nothing i mean i'm not criticizing or anything it's just the sort of like different circumstances people are born uh, in you know so uh, and then Gita actually answers the questions why, uh, answer the question why this happens, why people are born in different circumstances. So that's, that's the beauty of it. That's why I like the book. So then uh, later my brother, I asked, I started asking him questions and he, he said, I don't really know, but there are people who are sort of like secretly meeting to do yoga, like uh, asanas. And if it's yoga and asanas, it's like, it's, it's, it's viewed as uh, just physical education. So it's not religious. So you can just uh, go there and then there would be people who would come there and sort of like secretly disguised by, you know, yoga teachers, they will just talk about karma, dharma and all these things. So I started uh, going there. I was, I was a kid. I was like um, early teens, mid teens, but I was just so happy. I, I could discuss these matters. So, and, and that's where my journey started. And then you was just a, uh, uh, broke up into different independent countries and Ukraine became independent. And then, of course, we had first uh, properly translated, properly published Bhagavad Gita. And then I was helping actually in preparing those books, uh, translating into my own language. So and that's that's where the journey started. So that's when I started reading more because I just realized that Gita is just a gateway. You know, Gita is just the, the summary, the essence, but there is so much more to it. Yeah. So that's how my journey was. That's a very, very fascinating story. And like you mentioned, uh, you and Rahul Ji come from starkly different worlds. The contrast is striking. Uh, growing up in India, like Rahul Ji, even me, uh, I was surrounded by wisdom and temples and uh, uh, scriptures, but we didn't think too much about it till we actually probably went outside the country. So, so true. Uh, and for you, uh, we can't even imagine how life must have been where you're prohibited to even think of God or speak about God. Uh, but that is uh, fascinating and it shows how far you've come from growing up uh, in a place like Ukraine. So that's wonderful. So tell us a little bit more uh, uh, about how both of you met and how did this journey of writing the book come along? Yeah, so uh, we actually met in NTU on the university campus uh, in 2008. And uh, both of us are very inquisitive, very curious, and we uh, are interested in other cultures. So so much to the, to the effect that... Uh, uh, Galina likes to tease me and say, you're a white person in a brown body. And I tease her that you're a brown person in a white body. So uh, so we both were uh, uh, kind of interested in uh, each other's culture and uh, and various other things. Uh, she, so so she, I was in engineering department. She was in pedagogy department. So uh, we used to talk about, okay, these are scientific concepts. How do we, what is the best way to uh, communicate this to, uh, to students and uh, discuss about philosophy and many other things. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Galina at that time was what I would say uh, a following Hindu or a practicing Hindu. And at that time, I would classify myself as, uh, as what you, you, you would call a charvaka or an atheist. Uh, so despite me coming from Ayodhya, uh, uh, I was uh, atheist, if you would like. And, and despite she coming from an atheistic country, uh, she was as Hindu as it gets. Uh, so, but we, we mutually talked and discussed uh, various things and that's where it started. And then my journey is very independent of hers. So in my case, after I finished MBA, I came back to Singapore and then I, I happened to meet one gentleman with the name of Raji Srivastava. So he had set up something called Artha Forum. Now Artha Forum, if you look at Artha, Artha has two meaning. It has either, it, Artha can mean wealth and it can also mean meaning. So it's a dual use word, Artha Forum. And the tagline of that Artha Forum was modern, wisdom, modern Business's Ancient Wisdom. So in that, there used to be Vedic scholars who used to come and talk about how to do business ethically. What is the purpose of business? And to me, that was interesting. And when I heard uh, more of these Artha Forum lectures, 
Uh, then I realized that every single one of those uh, and those people who were coming and attending these congregations, most of them were multi-billionaires, multi-millionaires, those kind of people. I don't know for what reason they invited me there. Maybe I used to ask hard questions or whatever. They used to um, invite me and uh, I was very fortunate to be there. And then I realized that there is, uh, how, how, how did these people uh, get so much wisdom of doing the business in an ethical way, serving the mankind. And I realized that all of them without fail had read the Bhagavad Gita and that got me interested. So my interest in Bhagavad Gita was not so much from a self-inquiry perspective because I believed that conscious, we are a bag of chemicals with in, in the skin and your consciousness is, is, a, is a result of chemical reactions within your brain. Whereas uh, when I talk to believers, they would come and tell that Consciousness within the body is a function of soul. When the soul is there, then you're conscious. So it's a very different view. So for me, that question of who am I was, was not bothering me. Who am I? I'm just a bunch of chemicals, which is thinking I am this. That, that's, what, that's what my take was. Uh, but what uh, interested me was the external way of looking at this. Okay, is there a better way of doing business? Can we do business more consciously? And can we not just worry about profit and look at planet and people? So that was my... Uh, interest into the Bhagavad Gita. But when I started reading the Bhagavad Gita, I realized it not only answers that question, it also answers the question of who you are, which you may or may not have pondered upon. So my journey started that way. And then at some point, uh, Galina and my journey kind of crossed. And then, uh, as I said, uh, I felt that uh, for somebody like me who is quote unquote educated on the Western education system, they may not uh, stumble upon this, this knowledge. Yet, there is lots and lots in the Bhagavad Gita, which is of great practical value, even if you take the divinity and the religious aspect out of it. So then I thought, okay, let me package this in form of a book. In fact, before that, Galina and I did a common course. We, we, we taught a course, uh, which has 10 sessions of one and a half hours each, where we talked about these various concepts, jiva, uh, time, karma, dharma. So we, we designed a course. And in one of those courses, uh, some people said, why don't you package it as a book? And we, we listened to that, but we didn't think about it because both of us were busy with our own books at that time. We were writing other books. But then at some point in time, I think it uh, sat within our brain subconsciously and then we started writing. Uh, so that's when uh, we collaborated. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, as, I, as, as you can understand by now, uh, my, my study in the Bhagavad Gita has not been as long as Galina's who has studied this for 20 over years. So when I was writing the book, the plot was there. I knew intuitively what I want to say there, but then I didn't have any scriptural backing or reference. And that's when I used to ask her, okay, how, how can we get a scriptural backing for this? And uh, Deepi Ji, you have read the book, so you would see it's peppered with shlokas, not only from, from, from um, Mahabharata or the Bhagavad Gita, but also from Upanishads and also uh, various other Puranas and elsewhere. So I used to come to Galina and say that, okay, do you have a scriptural backing for this? And then she used to tell me, okay, this is in Isha Upanishad, this is in Katha Upanishad, this is in Chatham Charitamrit, this is in Prabhupada's commentary. So kind of, you know, I was a bunch of question individually and individually she was a bunch of answers. So we had to come together so that that cycle starts going and rolling and then the book comes out. So that is, uh, I, I believe, the answer to your question. That's amazing. Uh, so uh, tell us, why do you think... Uh, the Gita is relevant in today's times. Uh, what is the practical application for this? Um, as I said, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, I mean, for you, for us, it was uh, a, a long way. For many of us, it was a long way to discover what actually, who's actually Krishna, why Bhagavad Gita, who am I, you know, uh, because uh I believe like I, I come from the country which was like totally blank and ignorant the people were not uh, getting any uh, like even those countries who are like officially having Christianity and studying Bible they still have some kind of a, a you know pre uh, preformed opinions about all these things but I didn't really have anything much so uh, I was mm -hmm. really asking the questions from scratch you know what is it all about and then when I got to know mm -hmm. who Krishna who is Arjuna I realized that um, you know that the, the whole setting was uh the whole setting was that that somebody i mean one person was asking arjuna was asking and krishna was answering so arjuna was asking the vital questions but when we look at it the gita was spoken five thousand years ago right it's just so long time ago mm -hmm. i mean don't people don't live that much you know like who who, mm -hmm. who on earth will be like looking at that but then when you start reading then uh 
Arjuna is asking the questions which you can also apply to your own life, like to me, like, uh, and Krishna is answering the question, which I, in the 20th century, when I was born, was asking myself. So, and then I started being worried. Mm. Oh, what else is there? You know, what else is there? And then not only I get the question, who am I answered? I also get the question, how I am in relationship to others? Why is it that, uh, mm. you know, how, what am I in this whole structure? You know, how uh, the whole material world is built? And, and even beyond that, if there is a spiritual world also, and then how they're connected, and what is the nature of the uh, jiva or an atman? What is the difference between jiva and atma, you know? And also, who is God? Uh, what, what kind of forms God mm. can take? So it gives... Um, a very neat and logical kind of explanation but that is also again if you look at it it's for the believers more or less for the believer if you like if you are accepting this idea that okay there is a spiritual uh, kind of like substance there is a material substance there is something in between uh, so but so i sort of like accept that because it just sounds logical to me and i had certain um uh, my personal kind of like experiences where I felt that this is relevant. This is really, yeah, this is, this, it, it, it resonates with me. But then when, uh, I guess, uh, as we say, the truth comes in discussions, you know, that's why we have dialogues. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why we have discussions. That's why we have, um, uh, that's why we exchange our opinions. And once we started uh, talking with Rahul, I realized that, that he can actually look at it from a scientific point of view. Uh, not only that he, we actually combine these two things, you know, like his scientific point of view. And then he looked at the Gita with a totally unbiased kind of eye, you know, like, oh, he's not a, he's not a believer. He's, uh, he, he thinks that everything is a bag of chemicals. And then still he sees the great uh, connection between the two, you know, and then we managed somehow to uh, realize that it's important to show that the Bhagavad Gita is not just blah, blah. It's not just the set of myths, like many people say. When you look at it uh, from a scientific point of view, then all these things make sense, even from a scientific point of view. And then those great minds like Einstein, like, like Oppenheimer, they, you know, they saw great truth in it. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's my... Uh, that, that's how I see it. Why is it relevant? It was relevant to me. And when I was a kid, then mm -hmm. I'm very sure that, I mean, and many people like me, so I'm very sure nothing has changed in the world. And I, and I'm very sure the youngsters who are born, like maybe 15, 20 years ago, they, there will be many of them who will still ask the same questions. You know, people don't change. It's just so, time. So, Deepti ji, if I could just uh, add on to that. So you see, technology advances, uh, things change. But at the same time, what remains constant is human endeavor. What in Sanskrit we call purusharth, the, the meaning, purush is person or human, and artha means meaning, the meaning of human endeavor. Why do you exist? So those concepts of artha, dharma, kama, moksha, they don't change. Your technology can change. You could uh, live in a totally different century. Mm -hmm. But the fundamental base of what motivates human, why do humans do what they do? How do we interact with the material nature around? That doesn't change. And to that effect, our book is not a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. It's, it's not, uh, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's taking a very different take on the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, we have approached Bhagavad Gita uh, as a book of knowledge, as an instruction manual. And uh, to that mm -hmm. effect, what we like to say is that the Bhagavad Gita helps you understand how a jiva, jiva is an embodied soul, interacts with prakriti, which is the material nature around you. In Kala, which is time, governed by the laws of karma, designed by the supreme controller or Ishwara. So that's our take on it. But in order to understand uh, those concepts in the Bhagavad Gita, you need to understand the ABCD of this. You need to understand what a Jiva is, what a Kala is, what, what the laws of karma are. Unless you understand that, you will not be able to understand the Bhagavad Gita. So this book, if Bhagavad Gita were, let's say, uh, a play uh, written by Shakespeare, then in order to understand a play written by Shakespeare, you need to know the ABCD. So our book essentially prepares you to understand the Bhagavad Gita. It's teaching you the ABCD of, of, uh, of the Bhagavad Gita so that you can finally read the Bhagavad Gita. In fact, in that sense, you would see 
that the book is upside down. The last chapter in the book is what is the Bhagavad Gita, right? It's not the first chapter. Mm. And in that last chapter, what is happening is that Charan Saket is gifting a Bhagavad Gita to Anveshak Jigyansu in the very last page mm. of the book, which symbolically tells the reader that, hey, now it's your time to pick up the Bhagavad Gita now that you have understood these concepts. So that's how mm. uh, we view the Bhagavad Gita. That's how we view our book in that uh, continuum of uh, why Bhagavad Gita is relevant and why even more so today. If you see, uh, mm -hmm. Bhagavad Gita is spoken in, 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 a, in a war field. It's not spoken in the Himalayas, right? And we all are fighting our battles every day, whether at work, whether in relationship or in society. So even if today you look at geopolitics, there is a conflict going on in a lot of places around the world, in the Middle East, in, in, the, in the place where Galena comes from. So yeah. if at all, it's much more relevant today than perhaps it was 5,000 years back. Totally. I love it. I love how you uh, explained uh, why it's so relevant and that makes sense, right? So do you think the world would be a better place if everyone acted from a space of knowing uh, why we are actually here? And do you think the way the world operates would change? Yeah, I totally agree with that. Uh, see, in my own case, uh, as I say, Galina said, used the word Bhagishali. So I would say I was fortunate that I met uh, some of the very uh, successful people in business yet doing their business ethically. And that uh, got me interested into the right way of doing business, not just profit, but the planet and people as well, the triple P. And then I started lecturing on concepts like conscious capitalism, impact investing uh, within my circuit, within the IAMs. And, and, and gradually I, I became a changed person because until that point in time, my whole endeavor was how can I get the highest paid job from IAM, which I did, and how can I make more money for myself? But then Bhagavad Gita uh, told me that, okay, your purpose is, is over and beyond that. Athato Brahma Jigyasa, right? Now that you have the human life, inquire. Inquire what? Inquire who you are, who is Brahman. And in that process of inquiry, you see the oneness in the world. You see uh, that the entire universe is connected in some way. So when the law of karma says, be good to others it's actually saying be good to yourself because why does it say what you do will come back to you because it's like the right hand chopping the left hand sooner or later you will feel the pain so in that sense if you read the bhagavad gita it really does give you a purpose of life and unfortunately most of us will go from cradle to grave without realizing what our purpose is without realizing why we are here and running mm -hmm. like headless chicken without knowing the direction. So speed is so much more important in direction in the modern world, right? But ultimately you need a sense of direction. So I think to that effect, Bhagavad Gita is a book which helps you uh, give you a sense of direction. And if you look at it very fundamentally, forget about divinity, forget about religion. What is Bhagavad Gita? It's 700 shlokas, 1400 lines, hardly a 75 minutes to 90 minutes conversation. So what changes in that conversation? It's the same Arjuna, it's the same Krishna. What changes is that 75 minutes back, Arjuna did not know his purpose. He was the highly qualified, the so-called Sarvashes Dhanurdhar, the most qualified archer. Yet he didn't know what he's supposed to do with his life. And to that effect, I call him the first, uh, I call Arjuna, uh, Krishna the first motivational speaker of the world. Because Krishna motivates Arjuna to do his duty. How many such people we know? We know so many such people who go to the top-notch universities, have studied the best books in the world, yet do not know what is their purpose in life. So we are all like Arjuna in that sense. And then Krishna, even after 5,000 years, becomes that, uh, that light that shows us what we are supposed to do. So I think definitely if people, more people read the Bhagavad Gita, even if they read it purely from a philosophical point of view, which is my approach, that is how I approach, you still will get a sense of direction and purpose in your life. I mean, that's Perfect. what happened to me. I, you know, I just wanted to add, that's what happened to me, you know, because I had this uh, kind of like backing with this kind of knowledge. I don't say that my life was ideal and there were there was no ups and downs, but knowing that ups and downs come and go, like Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita says, it actually manage, It actually helped me to manage to stay sane in some of the difficulties, yeah, from my own experience. That's wonderful. Uh, uh, Galinaji, actually, I wanted to ask you, uh, there is conflict happening in your motherland, like Ukraine right now. How do you think the Gita could be applied uh, to maybe come to a resolution? Do you have any thoughts on that? 
Uh, well, you see, I guess uh, there is uh, there is a lot of uh, things involved. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, we all know that now we are living in the age of Kali. And mm -hmm. uh, the conflicts are inevitable. Uh, there are there is such a great diminish in the qualities of humans that the conflicts have become part and parcel of life. You know, we have conflict for conflicts from 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 the moment we open our eyes. You know, every morning, and then we have to get through the day uh, sorting out multiple issues and all. So it's. The wars and conflicts are inevitable in this age. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons is because people don't, uh, you know, follow the, the 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 rules which are given to them uh, for for multiple reasons, for different reasons. Uh, so wars are sort of like inevitable, but we always have to look at the time and circumstances and what kind of pr principles are we are standing for. Uh, in, in that war, you know, like if, um, let's say we take uh, the Kurukshetra, which was, I mean, uh, like some time back, I was asked this question, does, does, does Gita promote violence? Because Krishna comes to Arjuna and he says, you go and fight. Arjuna comes to him totally confused and scared. And he says, look, I mean, I don't know what to do. I mean, it's not that he's scared to fight because he's a warrior, he's a Kshatriya. He can, you know, we know Arjuna, we don't have to describe what he can. But uh, he doesn't want to kill his uncles and, and whoever they are, you know, cousins. Uh, so he comes to Krishna and he doesn't know what to do. And Krishna tells him, look, uh, don't be silly. Actually, you are attached to them, to all of those people. But you, what you need to do now at this very moment, you have to go and fight. And why? So we have to look deeper at why. What actually happened is... Uh, the reason for this whole fight came about because there was no justice exercised. So uh, Arjuna and, and the Pandavas, they were not given anything. I mean, they are supposed to exercise their dharma, right, on this planet. They're kshatriyas, but they don't have, have any, even a single village to rule. And their cousin tells them that I'm not going to even give you that. So after Krishna and all of them, and especially Krishna, who was trying to get something out of it and trying to put this, I mean, to, to, to do things peacefully, even he failed. You know, if there is someone who is really so, uh, like, clothed, putting a totally blank eye on, on his duty and other duty and other dharma, so no, in this, in this case, you just get up and go and show the aggressor that it's not right because the dharma has to be exercised. So in that in those circumstances, at that uh, point in time, that was the only right thing to do. Because if you don't do it, then the adharma will just prevail, you know. And this is what we see happening. Whoever is stronger, you know. So uh, for the uh, going back to the conflict in Ukraine, uh, like Russia is trying to instigate, they're already holding the. Uh, like uh, the uh, you know the military conflict and which claims lives on Ukrainian side every day. Uh, well, because you see, there are multiple reasons. There are political reasons, economic reasons. But to me, somebody who comes from that area, I can see that the big impetus behind all this is to bring back the old USSR system, where you can be an empire and rule one uh, third of the world. Uh, and and be you know the king in this land and then you have the subordinate colonies and all and uh, people like me who've gone through that like my parents generation the grandparents generation and the youngsters also who learned the history they understand that uh, that was a totalitarian country and if we have that influence again there is nothing good which is going to come from that you know so the gross adharma is going to to come uh, so, uh, so I mean, if we don't say anything, if people s simply swallow that, that's probably not the very good thing to do. Another matter is how to sort this out, because you know, uh, war is always a war, and um, people apparently those people who already come to the war, they 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 have not followed the principles, you know, so. Uh, whoever is trying to attack the aggressor, he doesn't think, oh, okay, I have to be so pious and so righteous. So, I mean, we can only educate people about it, but when there is a situation already that you have to defend yourself, uh, then 
probably you have to act accordingly to the time and circumstances. You know, if somebody is attacking, then you have to protect yourself. So, I mean, that's my take, but of course it's not a, it's not a simple uh, situation. Yeah. But the, 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 you know, the hope is that the more we talk to the, the more we spread the message of knowledge about ourselves, about others, the, the higher chances are that people will think, uh, you know, before they uh, go for the elections, who they elect for, what they're doing in this world, how they're doing business, how to do the how to do things ethically. So the more people think how to do things ethically, the more they are aware of their situation, who they are, and how to interact with others in an ethical way. That can change things in future in the world. But and that takes time and a lot of effort in educating the generations. Yeah. I think I want to add something to what uh, Galina, you said. So you kind of hinted on uh, does Bhagavad Gita promote violence because it's instigating Arjuna to fight against his cousins. So what I would like to add here is that Bhagavad Gita, Gita does not promote violence, it promotes fairness. So in this current situation, if you see, there was a Budapest agreement signed up in 1994 between the Ukraine, Russia, and America, where it was guaranteed that if Ukraine gives up their nuclear weapon, and at that time, Ukraine had the most number of uh, nuclear weapons after Russia and USA, then their sovereignty would be guaranteed. But look what happened. They gave up their nuclear weapons, these uh, countries which are supposed to protect the integrity and sovereignty of the nation. In 2014, Russia annexed U uh, Crimea and now they are, uh, and some part of the Eastern uh, Ukraine, and now they are again lining up and trying to take away more land. So if you don't stand up against these forces yourself, then more and more of uh, your land will be taken away, which rightly, rightfully belongs to you. So a gross adharma has already been, already taken place by them not honoring the treaty that they had signed. So in, in such a circumstances, you are left with no, no chances. It's not like Ukraine is, uh, who is the instigator here? So against an instigator, you obviously have to pick up weapon. Very well said, Rahulji. Uh, so uh, help us understand dharma. What, how do we define dharma? Because some of the conflict that happens, or most of the conflict that happens in the world is because everyone thinks that their version of dharma is the right thing so uh, no one want no one thinks that they are doing the wrong thing and still do it they think whatever they are doing is right so according to every uh, person that's fighting a war their way is the right way so how do we actually define dharma uh, and the, and its universality yeah so human uh, beings are very good at justifying their actions right so uh, and and uh, for, for right reasons or for wrong uh, wrong reasons so first of all some misconceptions Dharma is not religion. That's the number one thing we need to understand. In fact, the word religion comes from the Latin word relig religio or religio, which means to connect. And if you are looking in a strict etymological sense, the equivalent of that in Sanskrit would be yog or yoga, which is which means to connect, not dharma. So the question is, what is dharma? What is dharma? The definition of what is dharma is given in Mahabharata itself. In Mahabharata, it says. Uh, Dharnat dharmam itehu, which means one that holds is dharma. Now the question is holds what? Holds this order of the universe. So anything which sustains the creation is dharma. Anything which destroys that creation is a dharma. So that's the simple definition. Now, what does it mean at various levels? So we know that uh, there are conscious being and there are non-conscious being, what we call jada and chetan. So even the non-living things have dharma. For example, if you were to ask me, what's the dharma of fire? The dharma of fire is to burn. What's the dharma of water? The dharma of water is to wet things. That's a natural propensity. So in very simplistic terms, dharma is the natural propensity of anything. So if fire were to start, uh, let's say, let's say uh, uh, water is starting to burn and, and fire is uh, starting to extinguish uh, I don't know, extinguish fire, then that will be a dharma because then that is not the natural propensity of these things. But at the same time, when you uh, slightly advance that topic and, and try to understand what dharma means at the living being uh, level, it's still the same. It's still sustaining the creation. So whether it's a cow or whether it's a, uh, it's a buffalo or whether it's a tiger or whether it's a horse or whether it's a plant, it's all about sustaining the creation. But 
each of these have some potency to disrupt that balance. Like, you know, a tiger could, uh, I mean, if you go to the jungle, a tiger is, uh, uh, there would be a system, there would be a food chain, tiger eats one deer or whatever, right? But if the tiger starts eating hundreds of deer, then the balance get, gets uh, destabilized, but that's not going to happen. But when you come to a human level, humans have a great ability to both sustain and destroy the dharma. Like in the Spider-Man movie, they say, with great powers comes great responsibilities. So human beings have the mental capability, the intellectual capability to actually cause a gross disturbance in this entire system. That's why we talk about environmental balance, right? We have uh, grown so big and our we have lost the discretion between what is a need and what is a want. And with the result of that, we are depleting the environment. And then we are talking about whether it's the right thing to do. It is obviously not because you are depleting the planet at a, at a way which is not sustainable. And in that sense, that becomes so-called adharma. Now, coming back to the question, then why is it that uh, people uh, call uh, dharma equal to religion? Because all religions in the world are actually telling you the same thing. They are telling you how you should live in the righteous way. So in that sense, yes, in the very broad sense, you can say dharma is like religion, but etymologically dharma is not religion. Now to answer your question, why, why do we have so many conflicts? Why do we not understand dharma? Why does everybody feel that their dharma is the superior dharma? That's when you need to understand the concept of dharma sukshma. Sukshma means the nuances in dharma. So it's not that Arjuna did not know his dharma. He knew his dharma very well. He was taught by the best teachers of that time. He was one of the most qualified person, I would say equivalent to 10, 12 PhDs in one person in modern equivalent. So why is he so confused? He is confused and we are all confused in that sense because individually we know dharma. If I were to ask you, should you tell lie? You will say no. If I were to ask you, should you kill somebody? You would say no. But the problem happens when one dharma is pitted against another dharma. So for example, in case of Arjuna, his dharma, he had two dharmas which were conflicting. His family dharma was telling him, protect your family. Yet his Shatri dharma was telling, if you don't kill your family members, they will cause gross adharma. So the question, the discretion is, is there. You need to exercise your discretion in understanding which dharma is superior. Because if you don't, then you will not be able to decipher which course of action to take. And course of action, as we understand, is karma. So your, your, your dharma becomes the guiding principle for your karma. What duty should I do? What should I, what, what my action should be? And in the same context, Deepti Ji, I will also talk about Swadharma and Paradharma. So Swa means yours and Para means somebody else's. So as I said, everything has a natural propensity. Fire is to burn, water is to wet, sugar is to be sweet. So that's their natural propensity. Similarly, all humans, all living beings have a natural propensity, which is again a result of varying degree of combination of Rajas, Sattva and Tamas. So depending on what combination you are, you have a natural propensity. So you need to find a job or you need to uh, uh, fulfill your du duty, which is in accordance with that Swadharma. For example, the same compassion, which is a gift for a doctor can become an inhibition for a soldier because if soldier is so compassionate, he will not be able to kill. So you need to find your own Swadharma. And that is actually the, the mantra of happiness. When you're not, when your dharma and your, when your swadharma and your action, which is your karma, are not in conflict with each other. So you need to find yourself. You need to discover yourself. Who am I? That's why that question which Galina was talking about. Before you understand your dharma and karma, you need to understand who you are. And, and in, in context to you, the how the entire universe operates. So uh, I, I hope that answers Deepti Ji in some sense. What is, uh, what is dharma? Yeah, yeah, that is, uh, thank you. That was very uh, clear and in depth as well. Thank you so much. And uh, I think you also mentioned about the, the equation for happiness in your book, right? Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so, so that uh, happiness equation is something uh, I, I got up like, I think this is uh, uh, somewhere in 2019. Uh, that's where my writing journey began. Uh, I used to write on LinkedIn because I didn't know any other platform. So the first uh, the first writing I did was in February 2019 and about 300 people watched. And then uh, next I wrote about 1000 and before uh, 15th or 16th uh, such writing I made, I used to write weekly. Uh, I was getting uh, 30 to 40,000 views on my writing. So that's that made me realize that I have got uh, something uh, which people like to read about. And one such morning uh, I just woke up and uh, suddenly uh, out of nowhere, this happiness equation came to my mind. And I think the previous few weeks I was uh, reading the Bhagavad Gita. 
And uh, in that happiness equation, what I've done is I have tried to uh, simplify the Bhagavad Gita 2.47. And what I'm saying is that happiness is equal to attainment minus desire. Such a simple equation, yet so potent. Now, what do I mean by attainment minus desire? So let's take an example. All of us have written exams. And let's say in an exam, you want to get a B grade, but somehow you get an A grade. Now you got more than you desired. Desire is very important there, by the way. Because you got more than what you desired, you become happy. But if you get C, then you wanted a B, you got a C, you're not so happy. So simple, right? But let's, let's, let's look at the nuances of this. What if you desire to get, let's say, A grade or B grade, and that desire becomes so powerful that now you are willing to do anything it takes for you to get that A grade. You are willing to cheat in the exam because now you're possessed by that desire or any salesperson who has ever bribed because his desire to be the number one salesperson or any CEO who has ever fudged number in his company because that desire to be the number one company is so strong. So when desires, when your desire are not in your control, then those desire end up possessing you. I mean, the, the irony of life is that things that you possess end up possessing you, right? So in that sense, that happiness equation also becomes so-called the ethics equation. You need to uh, have, obviously you need to have desires in order to pursue your goal, but then the desire should not become end all. You should not be under that grip of that desire. You should, after a point, be baragya from that uh, from that desire only then you can focus on the process the process should become more important it should be the things you can control your results you can't control right because whether you will attain something or not depends on a lot of other circumstances but if you're trying to fix those circumstances then obviously at some point you or the other you will be going down a so-called adharmic path so uh, the third takeaway from that equation is that you should focus on things you can control and what can you control you can only control your actions. So that's why focus on your action, be effort driven, don't be result driven. Because when you say I'm a result driven person, then actually it's a result that starts controlling your actions. So that's a, in, a, in a summary I've tried to explain in that happiness equation. That's, uh, that's amazing. So how do we balance, uh, you know, the in the real world or the world that we live in today is actually very result driven, right? Uh, if you look at how uh, the stock market uh, functions or how the economy works, it's all about uh, performance and impact, like how you do in your quarterly reports. No one's going to talk about how much effort did the company put in to uh, come here. So uh, with in a world like that, how do you balance and uh, stay true to what the Gita uh, says is the, the, the right way to live? So how do you balance uh, the both, uh, yeah. both these, these are very conflicting sure. philosophies sure. to live in. Sure. So this is something which I talk about in my conscious capitalism class as well. So uh, how do you balance? There is something called MBO, management by objectives. Objectives are set up and then you're supposed to meet those objectives, right? So how do you balance? So number one thing to understand in that happiness equation is, uh, happiness is equal to attainment minus desire. So uh, when I give this lectures at IITs and IM, because those guys are so mathematical, so they say they, they will come up with things like, okay, so if I uh, put my desire as zero, then I will always be happy. But can you? Can you put your desire at zero? I mean, the question is, can you? You can't, right? You will always have desire. Now, the question uh, that you need to answer is, what kind of desire should I have? If, if my desire is such that it is only making an impact to myself and myself alone, then that's a very selfish desire, right? But if you slightly broaden that desire and say, okay, I am trying, I have this company, I am trying to do uh, well for myself, but at the same time, I'm trying to do good for society. Now that becomes a slightly broader definition of what a desire is. And once you have set up your definition in, the, in, in, in that context, making it slightly broader, slightly beyond yourself, then you actually see a sense of purpose in, in what you do. And that purpose, by the, day, by the way, is not from Q1, say Q2, tak. Matlab, Q1 mein kya kia, Q2 mein kitna target meet kia. That is not the purpose. Then purpose becomes a long-term orientation. And that is a difference. There are companies which will do very well in a quarter. There are companies which will do very good in, in a decade or 20 years, but then they would be gone because they didn't have a purpose. So it's again that short-term gain, right? I mean, a, a student who tries to cheat in an exam, right? That's because that student is looking for a short-term gain. But then at the same time, if you look at the long-term perspective, what remains with you? Does do, do grades remain with you? I don't think so. What remains with you is your learning. So similarly for companies, when obviously you need objective. Objectives help you set goal. But at the same time, how do you meet those objectives? For that, you need a process. And for a process, you, you, need, you, need, uh, you, need, you need to put an effort into that process. And then again, 
whether you get the result or you don't get the result what i have realized deepti ji is that we may think that people don't notice your effort but if you sincerely do your effort despite whatever grades or whatever financials you 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 get out of it people do notice your efforts i mean there are companies like tata in india right why is it that we 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 talk about tata with so much respect and then there are other companies that i don't want to name but we don't talk about them with so much respect is is tata the number one company or is ratan tata the 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 the, the richest uh, individual in india no right but we still talk about these companies with great respect because they go over and beyond their call of duty they have a right sense of how to do business and that's why these companies exist for hundreds of years there will be companies which will come and go so in it so if i were to answer you more directly what i would say is that it's first of all a fallacy to think that people don't look at your effort they look at your effort and they in the long run people actually value your integrity your effort much more than your result the results can get you in your career 5 years 6 years but at the same time if you are very result driven that success will also be very hollow you will feel hollowed from within because you are not actually being true to yourself and you know i mean you can fool others but yourself you know even if it's a comp- either 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 in a company or an individual both know whether they are chasing numbers or they are doing the right things and you know into that effect dpg you can put a lot of compliance things and lot of uh, guidelines in 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 place and companies would follow those guidelines companies would follow those objectives but then again they are doing the right thing for the wrong reason they are still not bought into that idea that this is the way to do business and sooner or later that dissonance will show up and those companies do disintegrate even uh, countries disintegrate kalina can more talk about the ussr or what what were the circumstances under which such a powerful nation got disintegrated so unless and until you're true to a purpose i i, I don't think so you can go anywhere sounds good so uh, let's switch gears uh, a little bit to some of the concepts you mentioned in the book uh, you've uh, spoken about the jiva or the soul and uh, you mentioned that it's an alien on the earth so could you elaborate on that yeah right i will start maybe uh, yeah the i will just generally talk about this and then maybe rahul if you see it, then you can just chip in so um yeah i guess the the moment of inquiry actually starts when person starts asking who am i and then when uh like the understanding of who am i is different for everyone but uh like um uh, you know when when somebody is asking me what is a soul and why do you think there is a soul and so like who am i i'm a soul right sometimes uh, especially in the like christian approach people will say oh my soul you know my soul uh, me and my soul so it's a bit of a confusion but like to me it's not a confusion because i know i'm totally convinced that i am a soul so how do i know that like when i say oh my hand uh my leg uh <laughs> my stomach my my head you know so who is that i so there is definitely something which all of this belongs to you know and um uh, um and that is something which uh when it's present in the body then the body is alive right so there was a lot of research uh, where people were trying to pinpoint what is happening when the body dies you know why is the, why is it that the body is not moving anymore uh why is it that the body starts rotten so what happens what is the change you know so i mean the in in the christian tradition it's very clear that there is a soul which is in the body uh, which goes out of the body and then the body becomes uh, dead and that's that's it's not not useful anymore but what actually happens with that soul like what happens to to me as a soul and how do i interact with this thing so it's a very complicated concept because each of us is at the different re- level of realizing who am i you know uh, some people already realize that i'm a soul some people already um some people even had some after uh, outside of the body experiences and we do also have research on that you know uh, like um, uh, there are some people who were in clinical death they had near death experience and when they come back they tell certain stories and also all these many of these stories were documented and i myself met people who were telling me about that and in the book we also describe some of those stories how uh, the, the person knew uh, when the person was in the clinical death stage and then the person knew where certain things were put and and it was obvious that nobody else could tell you know so it's it's um every, each of us is at a different stage of realizing who we are and that we are a soul 
but um, from uh, like Gita explains, and it's not only in the Gita, in other scriptures also, that you see this, um, there are different types of world. There is the world of matter, there is a spiritual world. So what is the soul? What is this Jiva and Atma? Uh, we are at the moment currently, we are living in the material world, right? We have uh, material elements, which Ayurveda is talking about, uh, which is space, uh, uh, air, uh, fire, water, and earth, right? So uh, the whole world is composed with these materials in different different shapes and forms, um, elements, and our bodies are also composed of the same materials, but in a different combination. So uh, we are, I mean, like, for example, talking about me, like I, I do, I'm firmly convinced that I'm a soul, but do I realize that I'm a soul every minute of my life? Of course not. Very often I behave like a material body because something aches or I ache, you know, so, but in certain situations, we do have a clear distinction, you know, uh, that something belongs to, to me, something doesn't belong to me. It's, um, uh, there is a material world, there is spiritual world, and there is also marginal, marginal energy, which is the Tatasta Shakti, which every soul, which, which basically the souls belong to, the, uh, the, the Atmas. Uh, when they, um, so the, the natural state of a soul is to be in a spiritual kind of like a world, either in Brahman um, or wherever in the, in the spiritual world. And then when the soul, um, when the jiva, when the atma has the desire, let's say it's looking at the material world and just has this desire of, you know, or trying to see what is happening there. Oh, it's so fun, you know, there is this glittering, beautiful world. Let's see what is going on there. And then that's where that desire actually uh, gives the first kick for the atma to come to the material world. And that's when the Atma comes to the material world. And that's, this, this is the, and the first type of the, I mean, there are, we, we have the chapter in our book, which is about, it's, it's in the chapter of the soul. It talks about Panchakosh. So there is this causal body, which, the, which is the cause of all causes, which why are you, why are we, why we are ending up in the material world? Because we want to see what's happening there. There is a small, this small fraction of a second desire. Oh, let's see what is it there. And then we are already trapped and we are there. And then we have to see what we need to do. So then we have the layers and the layers of different kinds of bodies. So we have the subtle body, we have desires, we have, uh, first we have the causal body, we have ego. We have, uh, we have false ego where we start thinking that because we are in the material world, we need to operate within the material world with the same matter, with the same kind of a substance which this material world is composed of. This, this is principle number one. So we need to have a material body made of the five elements. So, and then after some time, we start thinking that we are actually this body. So this is where the, you know, where the, uh, the attachment to the body and the losing of the true ego starts. So ego is I, right? Um, from from Latin, so lo lo the loss of the true ego starts. That's when we 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 forget that we are actually part of the of the. We used to be in the spiritual kind of state. We are the marginal energy, and we can go under the influence of either. So once we are more attracted to material, that's when we get the fulfillment of our desire because atma. Uh, always has desires it's it's a it's a natural propensity to have desires so that's why when we are talking about the equation of happiness we we say that there is no way we ca can have no desires we always have desires it's it's about what kind of what kind of desires we have so once we want to have a desire to be in the material world we get this desire fulfilled and that's where the whole journey starts so we get the we start associating ourselves with our mind uh, uh, manas, buddhi, uh, then the gross body, and then after some time we get so attached to, to this, you know, to, to this place where we are that we forget we are actually, we have other propensities. We think that we become this body and we are totally like, okay, me, I'm going, I'm doing, yeah, but what is that me? And then that's why all these red races, because we forget the spiritual nature of the thing of ourselves so basically what is the difference between atma atma is a is a is a particle spiritual particle which comes to the material world and then it takes it becomes 
different different atmas become jivas, jiva atmas. So they take different uh, forms of bodies, different shapes. So that's that's sort of like. But each of them is ruled. Soul is basically like a driver in a car. So our body is a car in this material world, and we. Me as a soul, I'm a driver of this car, but arriving at the understanding of what is a soul is not so easy and it doesn't, um, it's not artificial. It requires some thinking and some, you know, reflection uh, on your action, on your on your thoughts and certain life experiences also. Yeah, so it's, um, these are the subtle matters which you can't impose and superimpose, you know, you can't, oh, you're a soul quickly tell me you're a soul no it doesn't happen like that you know some people realize that because they've had the quest for many many years some people don't experience that but so i'm i'm just sharing um you know the experience my understanding how how it is and my personal experiences in you know trying to sort out this matter for myself in answering my question who am i so i'm a soul and then all other things which happen to me in this material world are the derivatives of my actions yeah um, Deepti ji, if you may allow, I will, I'll, I'll yeah, answer sure. the same question uh, mathematically. So uh, we have this equation in our book, which is called the karma equation. And that karma equation says that your sanchit karma today is equal to your sanchit karma yesterday minus the prarabd plus the expense, plus the kriyaman karma. So what does it mean? It basically says, if we were to look at it in banking terms, your wealth today is equal to your wealth yesterday minus the expenditure plus whatever new salary you got. So why am I telling this? Because it's important to understand in the light of soul. So what is a soul? First of all, uh, that was a question. Why is it an alien in this world? So as Galina was mentioning, you have a spiritual world and you have material world and then there is a marginal world. Marginal because anybody in this margin can be on this side or that side. And that is what is called Tatha Shakti as she was mentioning. So the soul is like an amphibian. It can live in water. It can live on land as well. So when the soul has the desire to be in the material world, that becomes the cause of it to come in the material world. And that's why that, that very desire becomes the causal body, the cause for you to, to be in the material world. But when you are uh, in the material world, you need a material body to function. So that's when that causal body gets a subtle body, which is the manas and the buddhi. And then that gets, uh, again, uh, the panch kosha body, the body which is made of panch kosha. Uh, uh, which is again comprised of the five Panch Mahabhutas. So you need a body. And what kind of body? Uh, Padma Puran says that there are uh, 8.4 million kind of bodies. You could be in an animal body, you could be in a, in a plant body, you could be in a human-like body. So you, depending on what kind of desire you have, you will get a, a body assigned uh, accordingly. So then uh, the question is now that the soul is in this material world, uh, what is it supposed to do here? So all our Shastras say that soul is supposed to get out of here. And what is that get out called? That is called Moksha. Each of our scriptures talks about that. And that's why I say that soul is an alien in this material world because it doesn't belong here. It belongs to somewhere else. Now the question is how to get Moksha. So how to get Moksha is very simple actually. So the way the body progresses or the way the soul progresses in this material world is through Samsara. Samsara is cycle of life and death. Why does cycle of life and death happen? Because you have karma. For each, for each action you do, there will be some karma associated with that. And because there is karma, you will have to come and enjoy the fruit of that karma. So you cannot do any kriya without a karma being associated to, to it, unless you do nishkam karma, which is which is which is which you can talk about. But let's keep it simple. So when you come to the material world, your karma is zero. You can get out of this material world, which is to say you can get moksha when your karma score is back to zero. But how to make it zero? Even when I'm breathing, eating, I'm still having karma. So the rule of the game is very simple, but playing the game is not so simple. How do you do karma in a way that you get out of it? And that's where we call about, uh, we talk about nishkam karma. Detach yourself from the result of your action. That is when you have nishkam karma because you're not attaching desire to it and it will have no consequence on it, on you. That's when your thing are zero. So you should strive to add more and more of nishkam karma. And that is where the Bhagavad Gita 2.47 comes in. And that is how this karma equation links back to that happiness equation, which, which we just talked about. So in short, soul doesn't belong here. It's a journey that, mu- that it must go through. Uh, but the end destination of this journey is to go back to where it came from. That is uh, amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahul Ji, Galina Ji, for uh, 
you know so clearly uh, illustrating all these concepts that are actually quite complex uh, especially if you haven't heard of them or thought about these things before so thank you so much for that uh so one of the uh, reasons people don't read or follow scriptures uh, is because they think they're not scientific and uh, there's often this conception that they're all mythological they're based on stories that were created by humans for entertainment but you have clearly in your book explained how what we know of as science today is actually explained with great elegance in our scriptures so could you provide some examples about that Sure. Uh, so, in fact, uh, this is something which I picked up in the very few, very first few pages of the book, where uh, Anveshak Jigyansu, who is the protagonist, twenty-five-year-old uh, guy who speaks to a senior fifty-year-old guy, and he says, "You know, all this is myth. It's not true." And then uh, Charan Saket, who is the other guy, he asks Anveshak, "Have you read it?" And he says, "No, I haven't read it. What is it that these books can teach me, which my universities and schools fail to teach me?" so this is where the problem is we 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 come up with a belief about something which we haven't even read right so we we pronounce that bhagavad gita and uh, many other scriptures are not scientific before even we have read so first you read we say janna and manna na pehle jaan jao fir mano ki hai ki nahi hai scientific you have already pronounce a judgment and nothing could be further from truth let's let's begin with where where your previous question was what is soul how do we know soul exists so there are medical studies done on this there was a famous paper uh, lancen paper which had done studies on uh, uh, patient in in holland where people were describing about uh, near death experience out of body experience then there are, there, there, are, there is research done in, done in university of virginia where ian stevenson spent his entire life researching on uh, reincarnation is enough research done no but these are some of the researches which which force you to think beyond uh what we think we know not enough research has been done but in our scriptures it categorically says that there is a soul and soul is the cause of consciousness in your body your 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 consciousness is not a result of chemical reactions within your brain that's what it categorically says so how, so as i'm saying there are medical studies done on this and and uh, to the point that people are in coma and they talk about soul they talk about uh they being aware of what was happening to them so if consciousness is a result of chemical reactions in your brain and you are clinically dead then how are you conscious it, it kind of breaks logic right so that's number one thing i want to talk about when people say that uh these books are not scientific because in the entire bhagavad gita you can go nowhere unless you establish the concept of soul because the entire law of karma and everything else who is atman who is brahman builds on from that the other thing i can give you an example is uh when we say things are not scientific in 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 the hindu tradition the number 108 is holy right so even when we are chanting we chant 108 times so what's so special, special about 108 we don't know but let me explain if you look at sun you can actually fit 108 earth in sun coincidence maybe but then between sun and earth you can fit 108 suns that's the distance between sun and earth and between earth and moon you can fit 108 moons wow how come so many coincidences coincidence can happen once twice thrice but how come so many coincidences and even if i believe all this is coincidence how did the indians know how did they know much much before any technology was there how did the indians know how uh, if you read the uh, garbha upanishad it talks about how a fetus grows in the in the womb how did indians know and if if you are trying to talk about modern science you and i deepti ji when we went to the school we were told that sound does cannot travel through vacuum it needs a medium very recently we studied gravitational waves where two black holes collided and we can hear the sound of of their collision so how come it travels in vacuum in our scriptures it talks about the panch mahabhutas the five elements so it talks about earth which has five properties of taste smell sound and 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 two other and then it talks about uh, more subtle matters like water then it talks about uh, 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 air and then it talks about fire and then finally talks about space so it says space has only one property sound for the longest time if you went to schools in india in 90 in early 90s or in 2000 you would you would laugh at that you would say sound cannot travel through vacuum that's what we were taught but then how suddenly now sound can travel through vacuum our scriptures have been talking about it for so long so you can disregard this but then the fact remains that our scriptures did talk about this then again lastly we talk about big bang and big crunch right the universe comes from a big bang then there is a big crunch 
our scriptures talk about this if you read the shrimad bhagavatam in the third canto it tells you how time begins and it talks about the smallest unit of time which is basically unification of three atoms the time taken for that is called truti and it talks about the biggest unit of time which is the life of brahma which is 311 trillion years and it goes on to explain from truti how do you get pahar how do you get uh, din how do you get months how do you get year in a very scientific way so much so that it says uh, the life of brahma is is, is thousand mahayuga and one mahayuga is 4.32 billion years and brahma has equal number of night equal duration of night so a uh, so called uh, day plus night of brahma becomes 8.6 billion years and today if we look at modern science we say that the universe is 13.6 billion years old look at the comparison it's it's almost almost identical and who is there to say that tomorrow we won't revise that day in which which comes much 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 closer to what the scriptures say we don't know right so what i'm trying to say here is when we say these scriptures are not scientific uh, they don't make any sense most of the time we say that even without reading the scriptures at least and even if we have read we have not read it critically so in my book in this book and it is gets the gita i try to uh, each chapter i try to uh, build up logically even the concept of god i have tried to build up mathematically i've tried to say that if you look at godel's inequality if you look at banash tashki if you look at uh, chatin's theorem all these theorems tell you that there is always a gap in our understanding no matter how advanced our understanding becomes and even uh, if you don't uh, if, forget maths even if you look at it from a physics point of view the universe and the galaxies are expanding so fast that the galaxies are going further away even faster than the speed of light so you can never get any information from there because nothing travels faster than the speed of light so if you can't get any information from there then why are you speculating what of science so then you have to uh, apply other ways of understanding how the universe operates and that's what i talk about in the chapter of god so bottom line what i'm trying to say is that if you try to read things analytically logically then you will see there are lots and lots of similarity and that is what the title of the book also an atheist gets the geeta the book is written for a logical scientific mind uh, who comes with an unbiased slate and then reads and gets convinced that okay there might be some truth in these ideas even how do you prove things so i have talked about shat pramana i have talked about shat pramana i have talked about uh, uh, anuman pramana i have talked about uh, pratyaksh and i have talked about uh, uh, arthapatti upmana and all those and i have tried to say how using these frameworks you can prove something so uh, from my point of view i totally disagree with the statement that uh, scriptures particularly the bhagavad gita is myth it's not scientific i think it is not just scientific book but it's also a book on psychology because if you under, uh, understand it not not just hard science but also social science teaches you teaches you how human be- each human being is different how each human being is basically a combination of rajas uh, rajas tamas and sattva and then depending on what combination uh, that human being is their propensity is different so the way you talk to a murderer is different uh, to a way you talk to a nobel laureate because they are fundamental kind of people so this book the bhagavad gita in 700 shlokas tells you a lot about hard science this physics chemistry and mathematics but at the same time it also tells you a lot about social science so i totally disagree with that statement i think uh, this would be a great uh, book for anybody like you mentioned uh, not just an atheist but anybody that's in the mode of inquiry or even like skeptics right uh, whoever is uh, who are, and all of us that uh, got educated in india unfortunately uh, we were under the we were educated under the macaulayan uh, school of thought where anything indian or anything indigenous was seen with uh either contempt or uh, skepticism and i hope that this book opens the way to uh us appreciating our scriptures and uh the bhagavad gita even more so thank you so much for that i i'll just add something there uh you see somehow we are trained to be very apologetic about who we are indians mm-hmm. right we we are very apologetic about who we are we don't like to express ourselves in fact uh, most hindus will tell you no 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 we don't practice it uh, we are very secular we are we are non uh, ritualistic why and and uh, that other time uh, on the other hand what happens is that we don't believe in our own self until it's endorsed by the west so yoga is suddenly uh, cool because the west is doing it uh, or for example let's say uh, golden latte is suddenly in in fashion because uh, 
in the uk they are selling that haldi ka doodh as golden latte right so suddenly everything for us becomes attractive and it comes from the west so we are kind of looking for a rubber stamp from let's say a nasa or a harvard before we accept it so we have to get over this mentality for the longest time the biggest export of india was not it it was spirituality we are the light of the world we need to understand that we are the hope for the world a lot of the concepts that we talk about today uh, be be uh, be nice don't be cruel uh, sustain the universe these are vasudha kutumbakam the entire uh, earth is one family these are very indian concepts which are being repackaged and send us sent back to us through our universities because our universities are again following the mit the harvard the stanford the, the oxford and the cambridge of the world right but we totally forget that we are the center of this knowledge very true very true i love i love the way you explain that and uh, i hope that uh, with the advent of social media and uh, books like yours uh, people will open up their eyes to the richness and the uh, the greatness of our culture and our scriptures and uh, everything that india stood for uh, ancient india stood for uh, i would actually like to uh, get galina ji's perspective on this as well uh, galina ji you were not born as a hindu but uh, what are your views about sanatan dharma and uh, spirituality of course you've studied a lot not just uh, indian scriptures but also you've done comparative study of uh, multiple philosophies so ha huh, what what do you think is the essence of hinduism and how is it different from all the other modern religions that the world has um thank you for the question and um well if you look at it i am um, well i didn't set it as a goal for myself to compare different uh, religions and compare different practices it's just happened to be such that the kind of the circumstances where i grew up was not satisfying my quest for the most vital questions in my life so i was trying to look for something else so in that case uh the being a growing up in the country which didn't allow any kind of ideologies ideologies apart from the communists i mean to whether i accepted it or not it's another matter uh like communism and all i mean i it's it we are not going into that but for the for my own search and my own quest for my own identity and my own understanding of myself it didn't it absolutely didn't give me any answers so but it's a sort of like a blessing in disguise because i was unbiased so i was really trying to find something which is uh comprehensive uh like uh, connected you know like uh, i was looking for a logical explanation of the things which are happening to me to others uh, in the world around the world and also i was um, asking myself a question like when you look into the sky you see the stars you see other planets and you ask questions i mean like we are just small dots within all this when you look there uh you know and 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 you see all this so much of depth so much of distance everywhere and then my mother told me that universe is infinite because uh, my mother is a math and physics teacher so she's like oh you yeah. i'm like mommy what what is there behind beyond that and she's like it's uh, it's infinite so there is no end to it so i was as a, as a four or five year old kid i was trying to imagine how it is infinite and she said we can't imagine because we are used to uh the world where everything ends so it will be very difficult to you so in that regard i was looking for the kind of knowledge and if you think about it we are it's not that we are born into something that's why that's why we become that like take a look i mean like me you know i was totally uh, in a born in a random country which is not even related to any sanatan dharma and i don't like i can't uh we use the word hinduism for for convenience you know but um Hinduism is not just, you know, is in the first place it's a concocted term, you know, uh, like because of the in industry river and all. So how do you define Hinduism? It's not even possible to define it because it's just so broad. And it it uh, as I was first uh, I was only looking at the just pure knowledge tell me who i am and what is happening so bhagavad gita was answering that then when i got to know about how people are living let's say uh the the, the way of living and all like you you see the the certain clothes people are wearing because of certain uh you know um circumstances because it's convenient to do so i mean 
So to me, the, this I, I can't even say it's Hinduism. It's more like Sanatana Dharma. It's more like a, it, it's a way of life. You know, you you live like you you wear this kind of clothes because this is uh, this is uh, what is convenient in in that climate. And you do this because this is also it's 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 reasonable. It's practical, and there is an explanation to it. Not just because oh do this or don't do this, just because like very often. Uh, I mean, I it's not that I'm criticizing. Like as as I was in touch with like other religions, very often they say do this or don't do this, but there is no explanation why. So um, in the uh, in the scriptures, in the I I don't want to even call them Hindu scriptures because I don't want to. To me, I. It's, I think it's unfair to just say that it's Hindu scriptures. It's like they only belong to you guys, but they equally belong to me, you know. Uh, I, I have the right to them. And it's uh, they, they, they brought us to, to my play. They brought those things to my play. So I also have a part in that. I want to have a piece of it, you know. And I know of lots of people who are just, you know, coming to India just specifically to get some portion of that knowledge which, which they are looking for. So... Uh, to me, it's a way of life. To me, that's more just a religion. And I would always try to, you know, emphasize that Bhagavad Gita is not so much about the religion. It's it's a it's a lens. Uh, it's a multiple kind of like complicated lens to look at at the whole existence, you know? So, I mean, we just happen to be so like, I mean, we look at the Indian person. Uh, it's not about, yeah, it's, it's like, it's, yeah, I was born in a totally... A country which was not related but when you look at somebody who is has got like we do have like some characteristics of different types of bodies right in in this amongst humans a human so we know like somebody is a little bit different even though i also don't buy into that because once i came to asia i just realized even though we have a little bit of differences in maybe color or what but everybody is smiling and crying in the same way and under the same circumstances so this is not what defined us our birth is not what defines us you know so um like you look at some indian baby who's born in the us and and raised up by some other parents you know adopted and raised up or well, we have in singapore we have uh, uh, chinese babies who were adopted by indian families after the second world war so they speak indian language they look different but they're like totally brought up so it's 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 about what you take you know it's not about birth it's about um i think that Sanatana Dharma or whatever we call it like yeah I, I like this word I like this word more than Hinduism because Hindu, Hinduism is sort of like a more like a narrower term you know because just we are trying to bring it to like we have Islam we have uh, Christianity we have Buddhism so we want to have come out with another ism you know <laughs> but yeah Sanatana Dharma is a much more comprehensive term to it and 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 I, I think that it's a way of life and I really think that it doesn't belong even though it originates from India uh, I think it belongs to all of us and it's a way of life of being reasonable uh, trying to look for your purpose in life so that's that's universal yeah Totally. Uh, I, I, I totally agree. I think uh, Sanatan Dharma is not even a religion in the, in the sense Christianity and uh, Islam and other religions are. It is more of a framework for uh, leading a purposeful life. And, uh, and like you rightly said, it belongs to the whole world. And I really, really hope that uh, through your book and uh, through uh, videos like these, uh, we can reach more people and uh, inspire them to learn more about the Dharma as well. So uh, thank you so much. This was really, really wonderful. Uh, I had a great time. Uh, I hope our audience also finds this conversation engaging. And uh, everyone, I would highly recommend everybody to pick up the book uh, and it is Gets the Gita. I've, I'm halfway through it and I've really loved, loved it so far and I'm looking forward to reading the rest of the book as well. So thank you so much, Rahul ji, Galina ji. Uh, this has been absolutely wonderful. Thank, thank you so much, Deepthi ji. It was our pleasure to be on your show. Thank you so Thank much. You.